You are in for such a treat today. I just recorded part two conversation with Cheryl Page, my friend who is now a wonderful medium, gets great wisdom from across the veil and is going to impart it with you here. It just is filled with joy, laughter, fun, and wisdom. So enjoy every minute. Hi, everybody. Oh, I know I'm always excited about my shows, but I'm really excited today because I'm bringing back a favorite guest of all of us, the way you responded to part one of my interview with Cheryl Page, said we have to get Cheryl back. Every time I rewatch that interview with her, I laugh out loud. It's just, it's the enthusiasm, the passion that we both have for this work, but the synergy between us, well, if you didn't watch part one, you'll need to go back and watch it again, but We will try to control ourselves today as we share with you wisdom, advice, information about the spirit world, and the answer to a very important question at some point in the next hour, how do I know it's not just my imagination when I connect with spirit? So welcome to the show again, Cheryl Page. Yay. Thank you so much for having me back. I'm so excited. Every time I get a chance to talk with you, I have this word, it's called dervishing. I feel like you and I go dervishing, just spinning in circles and letting the energy fly wherever it may. Oh, I love that. Yeah, the whirling dervishes, that was one way that they got into ecstatic bliss with spirit. I tried it once or twice and got too dizzy. It didn't work for me. (laughs) Did you ever try it? I never tried it, but I feel like you and I have our own special brand of dervishing. Yeah, why get physically dizzy if we can just get, get that energy flowing? Yeah. So let's just do a very brief recap for those who might not have seen part one or who have forgotten already a little bit about your background. Um, My background is 22 plus years in clinical research. So the lion's share of my adult life has been in conducting clinical trials with human subjects. On for for cancer, cancer primarily. I mean, some other subspecialties as well, but primarily oncology. Okay. So you're a scientist. That's what they tell me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you're, you, where are you living now? You're back in Colorado, right? I'm in Colorado, but I still work for that hospital in New Hampshire. Okay. Um, just I work remotely at this point. All right. And tell us how you got started going down the metaphysical path, the spiritual metaphysical path. So seven years ago, or coming up on seven years ago, the love of my life was crossing a highway and met with a truck at an untimely moment and was catapulted into the next octave, as I like to call it. <laughs> and when Scott's body died, I began asking a question. I'd never heard of you. I hadn't really spent much time. I didn't know anyone who knew anyone who knew anyone who knew a medium. Um, but it also felt like he couldn't just be gone. It didn't didn't make sense to me. And yet as a scientist, I didn't want to feel better because I was making things up in my head. So well, I know none of us do. And it's and that's why I said it's the number one question. Like, I really want to feel better because I know my loved one is here. Yeah. 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 And so not only did I want to ask the question i didn't even know what the questions were but as i figured out okay does his consciousness is it possible that consciousness exists beyond the physical body and there seemed to be data to suggest that that was being talked about and so i went down every rabbit hole i didn't just go down one rabbit hole if there's a meadow full of rabbit holes i went down all of them (laughs) to try to find out both the plausible and the fantastical and everywhere in between, because I wanted, you know, in science, if we are asking a question, we want to look at all the data so that we can make the most informed analysis, right? So I was asking lots of questions and listening to everybody who wasn't nailed down, trying to get some information. And I happened upon something which I think you might find interesting. And this is along the lines of the question. So in Aramaic, meanwhile, back in the time of Christ, in Aramaic. Which was the language that that Christ spoke. Yeah. Correct. And I'm looking at my definition. The word death in Aramaic translates to existing elsewhere. No kidding. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. 
So, so I was happening upon all kinds of information, but that sort of gave me something to hold on to. Like, okay, so there's a possibility. And I didn't want to, Suzanne, just look at 2017. And now in 2024, I still, I want to look across the spectrum because I think we have this sort of addiction in society to new is always better. Oh, not at all. As you and I know, gee, they've, they've been doing research into the afterlife for over a hundred years and there's so much good material that's been ignored. Yeah. Or just been lost in the sands of time. <laughs> so my thrill has been to, to sort of peel back the curtain of these things that, you know, 100, 150 years ago, there was really interesting, credible people doing research. You know, E equals MC squared wasn't yesterday. That was 1903 or 1906 or whatever. I mean, there's a lot of good data that came out of that sort of crux between the 1800s and the 1900s that, anyway, I digress, but still I wanted to know if it was possible and i from where i stand now i you know i think that you said to me at one point suzanne you sort of go from tragically from hoping to believing to knowing that's the goal and but there's there's always an aspect of knowing in all of us that fuels the hope to the belief, to the knowing. It's already there. And that's why we can't ignore it. That's why we go down the rabbit holes or go straight to one path that leads us to ultimately uncovering the knowing. Yeah. And here's something you might like. So if we think of the word know, K-N-O-W, to me, I've delineated it. So knowing is my head, K-N-O-W-I-N-G, and G-N-O-W-I-N-G is knowing from my heart. The Gnostics Oh, so gotcha. Spiritual knowing. Yeah. And maybe spiritual is too wavy gravy for the scientists out there. So we go from the sort of analytics into the language of the heart. The HeartMath, HeartMath Institute has all kinds of data about the frequency of the heart. So I sometimes will find myself in my K-N-O-W-I-N-G, which is useful. Mm hmm but when I want to grasp something outside of my five physical senses, I drop into my G-N-O-W-I-N-G. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the true wisdom, the knowing. Cool. Okay. So then we'll just briefly mention that you, I was your first reading, had a reading with a medium? No, actually, you were my fourth because your waiting list was long and you had said oh here's another medium who might be able to get you in sooner so I had a couple of other readings but then there's you know that little emoji with the exploding head I don't know if I know that one I'm gonna have there's to find little that. exploding head wow emoji and you were my exploding head uh emoji reading <laughs> Okay, cool. Well, it, what, what, however we get there <laughs> to have that personal experience of of knowing both k and g knowing that's life changing yes so i would say that then you am i correct that you then just went you didn't just stop at that okay scott is here you just opened up a whole other world for yourself and and became a researcher <laughs> of the afterlife and mediumship in addition to your day job correct and i still have you know like the old comics used to say right don't quit your day job <laughs> so I definitely still have my day job. Um, but if I have a mission at this point, and that is, can I demystify? And I think you do exactly the same thing. How do we demystify this so that it can be more digestible to more people across a spectrum? Yeah, I, I went to a dinner party last night and it's still challenging to just talk about these things in simple terms, very briefly, so that people understand it and don't put up the deflector shields. Right. Yes. And yet, you know, you make an important point, Suzanne, and I find this in the scientific arena as well as we'll call it the spiritual arena, is that we have a set of information. And it's the information that, let's say, collective we believe, whether the scientists believe it or whether the spiritual folks believe it. And it takes a while, even when there's new data, it takes a little while before 
there's buy-in from the collective. Oh, yep. like, you know, poor Galileo. I always reference him, you know, like, oh, we got a problem here. Yeah. And so there's new data. And yet what I try, like when I do talks and things, I always try to put in a disclaimer. And my disclaimer is this is my understanding. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we're not, we're not trying to say this is the absolute truth. I don't believe anybody has that. No, but you introduced me to a wonderful author, uh, Itzhak Bentov. Love him. Books. Uh, and he was so ahead of his time and unfortunately killed in a plane crash, probably because he wasn't going to make too many inputs <laughs> in the 1970s. But yes. his book, Stalking the Wild Pendulum, I have three copies. I take it on the road with me every once in a while. Amazon's going to wonder why there's a sudden bump in sales of <laughs> Stalking the wild pendulum, but it's just, it's, he was such an out of the box thinker. So I can understand why you love him. And, and I know why I recommended him to you. Well, and there's stalking the wild pendulum and there's a brief tour of higher consciousness. A brief tour of higher consciousness. I only have one copy of that one. <laughs> but the, the, the thing is there's a video and I don't know, it wasn't Phil Donahue, but there's some little 30 minute video of him being interviewed on a talk show like the year before he passed. Yeah. And in that interview, he says, this is my understanding from my present level of ignorance. Oh, I love that. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's humble. And I hope that in the very next minute, I get more information. I don't want to think that, you know, for me, I've had to learn to make friends with the questions. And yet we're sort of addicted in our society to answers. I want to find the truth. I want to find the right answer. We were taught that in school. Well, it's part of that drive. And, and I love it because when we ask a very well-formed question very specifically to the universe, we then will be guided to the answers in one form or another. And then it just comes flooding at us. So nothing wrong with asking the questions no as long as like for me the way i think about it if i'm sailing if i'm floating down a river the answers for me personally are anchors it's where i dock my boat at the side of the river and the questions keep me moving they're the wind in my sails because it keeps me curious and i think there's value in that as a scientist yes we think we have an answer but we don't stop questioning Okay, well, one of the questions you asked that I just used an hour and a half ago, two hours ago, is the most beautiful tool that I'd love for you to explain to people. And that question is two words. Do you know what it is? Yep. Go for it. What if? What if? Yeah. And tell us, tell us how you use that and how it helps. So as I was, if we think about Newtonian physics, I promise I'm not going to go into the weeds, but with Isaac Newton, the apple fell off the tree and hit him in the head. And it was, there's a binary, right? It's a, what I would call the truth binary. It's either true or false. That's the Newtonian model, which all of us, you know, and what is Newtonian physics shows us is why apples fall from trees, why the car stops when I put my foot on the brake. But quantum physics gives us four-part logic. It's so reading great. this. I love that you've got this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so the four-part logic gives us could be true or false. It could be true and false. It could be neither. And it could be, oh, I forget what the fourth one is. But so it basically is opens it up to a broader possibility. And so as I was going down the road of does Scott still exist, I realized true and false wasn't going to get me there. I needed another category. So in order to stay curious and not- You mean true and false, like he's either dead or he's not dead? Yes. Right? Exactly. Okay. Yep. And so, and then I was going down all these rabbit holes and I was being exposed to so much new information I needed some way to stay in the game. And the way I devised to stay in the game was what if? What if it's real? What if it's not? What if I'm crazy? What if I'm not? What if he's here? What if he isn't? But 
if I could always, if there's a spectrum, the midpoint on the scale for me was what if. That was my home base. It leaves you open to all possibilities, which is quantum physics versus Newtonian, where anything is possible. We're, we're tapping into possibilities. Yes. So that was my strategy. And I employed it very intentionally as a strategy when I would bump up against something <laughs> that I just knew couldn't possibly be true, but I wanted to stay on the path. I would just come back to, well, what if I don't know everything? So it kept me moving. And so it's employed as a strategy. It's a good way, especially for the new folks. I have such a soft place in my heart for the people that are new on this journey. And you're asking all the questions that you asked when Susan graduated and when Scott graduated, I asked the same question. When now, I mean notice everybody how, how she, she uses different words for dying because we know that death is not the end. So she's talking about my stepdaughter, Susan, her love of her life, Scott, graduating to the next level of existence, not dying. Yeah. And graduating. Is, it, is, this a, is this just a way to make us feel better? No, absolutely not. To me, if you think about it, and again, what if? For me, graduation has a, you, you succeeded at something. It's a positive declaration. Whether he died and is buried under the ground and that's the end of it or not, graduation has an elevated frequency versus dead. Yes. It's a very flat, not so energetic frequency. And every thought we have truly does determine what we're radiating to the world, what we're doing to our bodies. So choosing word, words carefully like that, it's so important. So let me tell you how I just used what if. Yes. A couple hours ago, I was asked by someone I respect who tests mediums if I would do an experiment with another person who he was working with to connect with a very important person who passed some time ago to see if I could discern very specific information, one of these secret password type things that mediums really don't like to do because it's challenging to get specific things. And I was not the only one who was going to be asked to do this. And I had to keep reminding myself, they're not testing me, that's not in question. They want to see if they can solve this puzzle that this person actually left behind yes. for people to discern from across the veil. and. You know, my Navy training says you you just say I I you don't say no I can't do it I won't do it you have you have to well this is my personal BS yes. belief system I had to say yes and so going getting into it beforehand I sat here and I said well I'm listening to my human side say you know it's very specific and I just brought up your phrase and I said but what if we get that information we don't know. So it's a joyous feeling. What if? And and everybody listening may think, oh, I'll never connect with my loved one. But what if you do? No. Exactly. And I'm so glad you brought that up because there was one instance. There's a dear friend of mine and she is adopted. And she both, she'd done sort of that, what do you, the DNA test, you know, where you 23 and me or whatever it's called. Huh? And so she had found two men both in spirit, who might be her biologic father. Hmm. And, and she uh, she wanted me to do a reading to ask them which one was her biologic father because the DNA sort of implied this, but the, the, the mother, the biologic mother said, no, it's the other guy. Yeah, pressure. Yeah. <laughs> so we're about to get on Zoom and I'm sitting here and I'm saying, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And clear as day, the message was, you're not going to do this. That's right. That's right. We're Spirit going to do does it. it. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. And they did a beautiful job in such a glorious way of giving me, giving us the information in a way that if I was trying, I'm tripping over my own spiritual feet. Yeah. 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 If we get out of the way, then spirit can flow. And it's all those words and negative thoughts we have that block that flow. So this, this joyous attitude and this what if phrase is freeing. Beautiful. Yeah. I want to grab something off my bulletin board to show you. Hold on one second. Okay. 
<laughs> I've something I'm bound and determined to put back into the everyday parlance because I'm so I've been intrigued with words and the etymology of words. I'm constantly looking up what we think our contemporary understanding is. And then I go back to Webster's 1828 dictionary, because that's as far back as I can get to look at what did they think it meant in 1828. Hmm. And one day I asked myself, I asked myself, okay, so why do they call it spelling? Like, so if a witch, let's just use a witch from trick or treat, whatever. But if witches cast spells or Harry Potter casts a spell, why is it called spelling? Oh, what a great question. Yeah. And so I went down that rabbit hole and I was so intrigued to learn that the correlation is if you, I'm oversimplifying, but if I say, Suzanne, I love you and I respect you and I admire you, those are all spells that I'm casting on you. Whereas if I say something negative to you, that also casts a spell. And the, a spell being a change in one's energy field. Yes. And what is a spell technically is a word or sequence of words that causes an effect. Huh. huh. So I'm going <laughs> to. So if you could think of like one magic spell that we've all heard our whole lives, what's the spell that comes to mind for you? <laughs> you mean a spell that somebody would actually put on someone else? Well, like, you know, you hear it, it's abracadabra. Oh, oh, okay. You know, right. like the one that we all think I'll abracadabra. On that one. Yeah, yeah. Abracadabra. Okay, gotcha. So Which I'm, gonna, nothing. <laughs> I'm hoping you can see this. See this little pendant. Yeah, yeah, perfect. And it if says abracadabra. Has. And all the A's and then all the B's and all the C's. Yeah. Hang on a second, Cheryl, because a lot of people are not watching. They're listening through podcast. Okay, yeah. so it's a little triangle and they've spelled out abracadabra in a triangular form, creating a design. OK. Yes. And so this. So I became really intrigued, I'm just as such a geek when it comes to this. But <laughs> so I wanted to know what's the origin of abracadabra. Back to that exploding head emoji. It goes all the way back to Aramaic. Hmm. That's how old it is. So in the Aramaic, I have the definition here. Do you so see how her brain works, everybody? This is, this is fascinating. <laughs> so the Aramaic translation is, it will be created with my words. Abracadabra? Yes. Oh, wow. Now, the Hebrew, if we come forward into this Kabbalistic mystics, the translation in Hebrew, which I really love, is speak the blessing. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? So this image of this inverted triangle with the abracadabra, they would wear this as a pendant or a, on a piece of parchment or on an, an, a metal pendant for the wealthier people. And they would wear it with the triangle pointing down, which meant speak the blessing or it will be created with my words. But if you inverted, if you pointed it up, it becomes I will destroy with what I speak. Wow. I know. So these are belief systems here it, as far as what that triangle does. But our words and our thoughts absolutely do create and destroy. A hundred percent. And so that's why back to you helping clarify the idea of graduation. To me, I want to elevate what happened rather than not. So to that Scott graduated fills me with something. It casts a spell even on me. That is a it keeps a possibility open versus like you had said to me early on, you said there's three things that you can do when you get a sign. Okay. The first thing is thank you. And the more enthusiastic, the better. Mm -hmm. The second thing is to ask a question. Scott, is that you? Because if you ask the question, you're entertaining the possibility. And possibly starting a conversation. Exactly. And the third thing, which you said is the worst and the spiritual equivalent of slamming the door in their face is, isn't that a coincidence? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, no meaning, not really them. I'm imagining it, you know. I'm I'm connecting dots where they don't exist, that kind yes, of thing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And why do we do that? We dismiss something that's that could be a beautiful connection. I believe that's learned behavior. It is. And we ca- just to keep in mind if there's a takeaway with the words. If you you know that old saying about the the pen is mightier than the sword? Mhm. If you look at the word words and you spell it backwards. Sword. Huh. Yep. Okay, so give that meaning. Expand on that. For me, the meaning is which way am I going to slice it? Am I going to cut it in a positive way? Am I going to cut it in a negative way? I have the sword. How am I going to use it as a tool? Yeah, with your words, with positive words, with a very careful word selection. That's right. I do that all the time. My favorite one, and when I'm teaching a lot, is I used to say, I, I really want to stress the point. I don't, I don't say that anymore. My guides caught me. They said, no, emphasize the point. I don't <laughs> want to stress yeah, anybody yeah, out yeah, here. That's I great. really want to emphasize the point. And, and it just, it's just these minor shifts, but they add up. They do add up, yes. All right. So let's shift gears here now, having set the stage here that you you connected with Scott, went down a lot of rabbit holes. Then you established your own connection with him and and many others. But I know there's no doubt in your mind you're connecting with famous people, wise teachers from the past, your own people. If you missed part one, she is friends with John Denver, because they used to work together. You've connected with John yep. many times. How was it in the beginning? Did you question, am I making this up? Oh, my gosh. Yes, 100%. And God bless you, Suzanne, because I didn't have anybody else. So I kept sort of terrorizing you. with, <laughs> well, What about this? What about that? And oh, my God, and I don't know who's talking. And this is so important, guys. One day... I reached out to you because I could hear communication, but I couldn't tell who it was and I was just losing it. And so I called you in tears because I was so frustrated because they're talking, but I don't know who's talking. And you, (laughs) you Obi-Wan said, it's more important that they're talking than who's talking. True. And that was really helpful because she said, you said, just be patient. Over time, you will be able to make that discernment. And in the meantime, the fact that they're talking is more important. And that sort of gave me a life buoy to hold on to until I got to the next phase of a broader understanding and upregulation of, I believe, my central nervous system. You know, you do so much work with the energy centers or the chakras. This, to my oversimplified perception is that those energy centers are the thing that give us more bandwidth yeah. as a radio station. Yeah. We can dive into that or we might run out of time. <laughs> let's, yeah. let's go back a minute. When you say, I said, it's more important that they're talking. I'm going to shift the words around here yep. because they are, our loved ones are talking to us all the time. It's more important that you were hearing them. <laughs> That's a very good point, yes. Yeah, they were getting through to the antenna that is the energy field and the chakras and the body part of that. So to this day, I don't always know who's talking when I sit in meditation. Is it my guide, Sanaya? Is it my guide, Brenda? Is it my my stepdaughter? It doesn't always matter. The, The bottom line is, is it helpful? Is it healing? Yes. Was it? 100%. And it always is. And I find that, so I have this running list of what I call the myths. Myths? Myth, M-Y-T-H. Yeah. And one of the myths is the myth of specialness. I'm not special. Or we're all special. It can, it's either one or the other. I have a framed picture right here. I, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it comes from an experience that I had with Jesus. Can you see what it says on the bottom? Oh, that's so great. All are special. All are special. Yeah. We're each unique. 
Yeah. And all are special. Love that. Yeah. yeah. So the myth of specialness, please continue. <laughs> so the myth of specialness is about, I have something that somebody else can't have. I'm in mm -hmm. the process of writing a, a, a course, a talk called Born Medium. If you were born, you're a medium. <laughs> I love that. As opposed to what most people believe, you have to be born seeing spirits and that makes you a medium. Yeah. Yeah. You were born that, and you are, that makes you a medium. I love That's that. Right. And we're all special. So we all have this capacity. Yeah. How about some more of the myths? So um, some of them aren't so popular, but <laughs> so one of the myths is it could take a really long time. And I know that that's sort of sacrosanct in a lot of circles that this is, you're going to have to do this for years. My unfoldment happened very quickly. And the, I don't have the answer to the why that is. Yeah. Was I more determined? Was uh, meditating two hours a day might have been part of it. But I think that we have to, like you call it the BS, right? What's your belief system? I didn't have a belief system about how long it was supposed to take. Mm -hmm. So it didn't take long. That's why I don't like to tell people how long it took me to connect with Susan. I was connecting with other spirits pretty darn quickly, but we just don't know. So what if? What it if? happens right away? What if it happens tomorrow and you give up today? That's that's a yeah. good use of what if. Yeah. yeah. So let's now dive yeah. into this. How do I know I'm not making it up when we connect with our loved ones? You, you've you really dived into this, as have I. So let's hear it from you. So someone along the journey said to me, that imagination is to intuition as talking is to singing. So you couldn't intuit if you didn't have an imagination, just like you couldn't sing if you couldn't talk. Huh. Huh. Oh, I and, love that. Yeah. So for me, I mean, you and I both know the biggest struggle is, am I just making this up in my head? So what if was one of my strategies? Okay, let, just let me just be clear. Yeah. In case we have anybody who's brand new to this podcast. And by the way, if you're new, we love when you subscribe to this channel so that you get to know when new videos are put up. So please click that subscribe button if you haven't already. But if you're new, you don't know what we're talking about. We're talking about the fact that all of us can make a connection with spirit, with our own loved ones who have passed, with, with great wise teachers across the veil. But when we start to hear voices or see images that are helpful in healing, that is the number one question. Am I making this up? Yeah. And so the what if place keeps me curious. And so I began to go down the rabbit hole of the imagination. And I'm going to give you my understanding now with the, that article I sent to you, uh, Henri Corbon. Uh, mundus imaginalis, if anybody wants to look. <laughs> it was deep. It was very deep. <laughs> but but the simple, so the, 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 what do you call it? The sort of Reader's Digest condensed version is my interpretation. The imagination is the tool. You have one, I have one, we all have one. So don't shun the fact that you might be making things up at first. Yes. And I, <laughs> even though this is dorky, here's the way that I think about it is I have a blender in my kitchen and that blender has a couple of different settings. So if I want to make a smoothie with my blender in my house, I can. But if Suzanne comes to my house, she can make a blender with my smoothie. No, wait, and wait, wait. She can make a smoothie with my right. blender. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she can make a smoothie with my blender because yeah. it's not just, it is a tool that can be used by someone other than me. Okay. So the imagination as a tool, I can use my imagination. And Henri Corbon distinguishes, if we think the tool is the imagination, there's the imaginary, which is I made something up in my head. That's one setting on the blender. Huh. The imaginal is the other setting, which is you can receive information from people in spirit because they can use your blender as well. 
Mm -hmm. So they can push a thought, like when you're doing a reading, you're given information through your the tool of your imagination, but it's the imaginal setting, not the imaginary setting. How do people know what setting it's on? Well, in the words of a really wise woman that I know called Suzanne Giesman, what you said is over time, you will begin to decipher the difference between things that you made up and like your thoughts and thoughts that are given to you. And that has proven itself out. So I think that the number one most important thing that we could keep in mind is to be patient with the process. And so that exercise that I talked to you about, like I hold out my hand and say, okay, put one thing in my hand. Yeah, I've been using that one for years and and bring and it really revived it lately in my teaching because it's so helpful. Well, yeah. and otherwise you have the 60,000 foot panoramic. It's too much to focus on. But if I'm just looking at the palm of my hand and the first thing that comes through the imaginal setting, then how, then I am just left with, I don't have to look at all of the universe. I'm just looking at whatever, if it's an alligator or the Eiffel Tower or a carburetor, it doesn't matter. We then can do the work. It gives us something to focus on. And the reason I do it is to, like here, this is such a great story. So I did a talk a few weeks ago. And at the end of the talk, I had my deck of Oracle card, my Oracle cards. And I just picked someone in the audience and I said, okay, I'm going to shuffle and you just listen for someone to tell you for me to stop. So I shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. She says, stop. I say top card or bottom card. She picks me to pick the top card and it's Mozart. Okay. This is such a great lesson. I'm so glad I haven't had a chance to tell you this. <laughs> so he hands me. And again, this is the part where you just trust. It doesn't matter. We don't have to worry about being wrong. Be brave enough to be wrong. So let me just back up a little. Yep. Cheryl made these cards with, with famous people on them and some that we don't know. But she trusts that those people are willing to help us to serve the greater good. So you pull the card and she pulled Mozart. Somebody prompted her to stop there. Now Cheryl is trusting that because she's thinking of Mozart and holding the intention to tap into his wisdom, she actually will connect with Mozart. And yeah. it's the evidence that's going to show whether or not you did or whether or not it's your imagination, right? Yes. Okay. So he puts in my hand a salt and pepper shaker. Okay. And what? And so for me, guys, this is where I'm at right now in my journey is I want the wisdom way more than I want the evidence. The evidence is fun. But if I'm dealing with these historical figures, I really want the wisdom. I want to grow myself with the wisdom. So he gives me his own pepper shaker. And he says, he shows me a bowl of stew. And he takes the salt shaker and he throws it into the stew, the whole shaker. The whole thing. Okay. Yep. And he says, that's not the right thing to do. You want the contents, not the shaker. The shaker is the vessel that's holding the contents. You want the salt in your stew, not the shaker. He said, and then he gets a little bit snarky with me and he goes, you humans, you know, you, you guys get so obsessed with the shaker. He said, your loved ones are now the salt. Mm. They are no longer the container, but the contents still exist. And I yeah. thought, wow, that is so insightful. And so he said, pay attention to the fact that if you're looking for the container, you may not see it, but the contents still exist. And so get this, Suzanne. So, and I've been talking to them about looking things up and whatever. So after the, after the talk, somebody emails me and she said, and I knew that Mozart was from uh, Austria. That's all I remembered. I wasn't really thinking about it. She says, you'll never guess what. Do you know where he's from? Salzburg. Oh, <laughs> that's great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. A little double meaning there. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, and a skeptic would say, oh, big deal, right? Not make the connection. It's a coincidence. But again, you do this often and not enough. You say, even if it is a coincidence, it brings a sense of wonder. 
it connects some dots. And what did you gain from that? Some really great wisdom that you were able to pass along to your class. Yes. And Suzanne, the, the, if you think about it from a scientific standpoint, any experiment that I do is not based on one experiment. We're collecting data. So it's not just Mozart. It's all of the different, and I document everything, all of the different, I want the wisdom, but if you could give me the evidence, that would be helpful because I'm learning. Mm -hmm. I have the collection. So at some point in a scientific arena, if you have a mountain of anecdotal evidence, meaning not proved with a double blind placebo controlled trial, you're irresponsible to ignore this mountain of anecdotal evidence mm. because there's clearly a trend. Okay. So I don't just look at the one, I add it to my PowerPoint presentation of the images that come. I want the wisdom and I ask for the evidence. And most of the time it turns up, not a not hundred percent of the time, but most of the time, so there was one recently. God. I was going to ask for more because you told some great ones in the last episode. And I just, this, these fuel me and they keep me going. Oh my gosh. So, and I, I don't know if I shared this one about Jesus and the leaf. I don't right. think so. Not, not in the show. Right. So I have a young woman that I'm mentoring and I'll usually say, if you could pick any historical figure, who would you like a message from today? And she says, Jesus. I go, okay. So we set our intention, we reach out, I hold out my hand, ask him to put one thing. And she had been talking about baggage and how to set things down and the things that in her life, her, her BS, her stories, you know, the things that she was struggling with that came up in our conversation. So he puts a maple leaf in my hand and I have a moment of pause because she's from Canada and I'm thinking, really? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. but he says to her, when the leaves fall in the autumn, do you rake them up and put them in the back of your car? And she laughs and says, no. And he says, do you rake them up and bring them in and spread them all over your bedroom so that you have to lie on them when you go to bed? She goes, no. He says, this is so great. So he says, the, le the trees do not weep for the departure of the leaves. He said, they're called leaves for a reason. <laughs> they're leaving the tree and going to the ground. And the tree has enough wisdom to know that there will be more. And so then he shows me this image, like his arms are out and he's a tree. And I hadn't thought about the cross part of that. But anyway, so she's beside him as the tree. And as though there's leaves on the underside of their arms. And he's going, yeah, and he's shimmering his arms and all the leaves are falling to the ground. And so, so part of my process, I forgot this is backstory. When we start to connect with him, I ask her to close her eyes. Imagine she's sitting on the couch. Using your imagination. That's what I was talking about earlier. It helps at times to use our imagination. Right. Yeah. So I said, mm -hmm. sit on the couch, eyes closed, and imagine you hear a knock at the door. And so I said, so you stand up in your mind's eye and you go to the door and you open the door and it's Jesus. And you're so excited and you embrace and you invite him in. So there's this whole process of him knocking at the door and coming in. So, so then he shares his wisdom with her. But then I say, do you have any evidence for us? It would be helpful because we're learning. There we go. And I'll, I'll send you the image later, but... So I just, he says, look it up. That's what I hear, look it up. So every time they say, look it up, I know it's Jesus leaf. That's all I put. I went to Google. So the, the evidence is going to be in the maple leaf that you first saw in your hand. Correct. Yeah. So I go, and I never go to do the Google search without him because it's his gift. Huh. So I invite him to scooch in beside me. And I say, okay, guide me to the message you want me to find. Jesus leaf. And up the very first thing that pops up is a maple leaf that someone has taken a laser or something or other. And it's a picture of Jesus 
lasered into the maple leaf. Nice. And yet the most amazing part is I was I just, you see Jesus and she and I are going gobsmacked, yeah. but then you read the little caption underneath and I hadn't noticed his finger was like in a knuckle. And what it says in the caption is Jesus knocks at the door. Oh, good one. <laughs> so then as I'm ready to shut down the window, there's another picture of Jesus walking away with like a dog and underneath it, it says, Jesus leaves. Oh, <laughs> so cool. But what, it, like you said, the evidence is very helpful and it's nice, but the message was deep and helpful, wise. Yes. You know, I have to share, I remember going to a state park recently and reading about trees and I never realized why the leaves fall off. And it, it goes along with that whole wisdom that you shared there that it, the leaves take up a lot of energy and the, the trees are getting ready for winter. And if all the leaves were there, the whole tree would die. And so the leaves sacrifice themselves and, and, and drop off to allow the tree to have just enough energy for what little water and sunshine is going to come in over the winter. So it's just part of this whole cycle of life that, that, that their death, the each of us only lasts a certain time. There's only so much we can learn in one lifetime. And then we come back around and do it again. Yeah. So can I tell you a story about me and Michelangelo? Please. So, and I'm just, I don't have, my, I think I've said this to you before. If I don't have to get on CNN and prove it to anybody, I'm just going to take the ride. Why not? Okay. So October of 2022, I took my son, 19 or 20 at the time, to Italy. I wanted him to see the art and the architecture and taste the food. and Awesome. But I'm thinking, wouldn't it be great to tour Italy and invite all the great masters to tour with us? Uh, see, someday everybody will think this way. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, it was so great. So we're checking into the hotel in Siena. And I, there's a line, like somebody ahead of me, and there's this unbelievably movie star handsome man behind me, catches my attention, and he's got three sons, so like sort of 16, 14, and 12, sort of graduated age, and they're all standing there like movie stars. And so, <laughs> so I turn around and I just say, you know, buongiorno, or whatever, and we start chatting and he says, allow me to introduce you to my sons. And he says, this is Michelangelo, this is Donatello, and this is Raphael. No, no, really. And then he makes some joke. I don't know a lot about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but he goes, yeah, I know there's the whole Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle thing, but that's not why I named them that. So, See, I don't even know about the Mutant Ninja Turtles. I'm just thinking it's so artistic and you had asked the masters to accompany you and there they are. Exactly. Yeah. And yet all the Ninja Turtles have a name of like the great okay. masters, right? Okay. So anyway, we were in Siena and like little things kept, you know, that might be something, might be not something, but I'm just taking the ride. I don't have to prove it to anybody. My mm -hmm. little experiment by myself. So we get to Florence and in Florence, there's something called the Academia, which is the gallery where the statue of Michelangelo's David is housed. Yeah. It's been there for 150 years or so. It's been there a long time. Yeah, I've been and there. This, it's awesome. Oh, it's <laughs> awesome. So I've probably, this was my fourth time, but my son and the friend that was traveling with us, they'd never been before. So they're ooing and aahing. And in the entire Galleria, there's only one place to sit. And it's a semicircular bench behind David. And so I sort of do my lap. And then I'm thinking, I'm just going to sit here behind David. Nice view. <laughs> so I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to invite Michelangelo to come and sit with me? So I just, you know, sort of center and extend the invitation. It does. It's not a huge ask. It's not a huge energetic exertion. And Suzanne, it doesn't always happen this way, but it was like a movie. My eyes were open. But it wasn't like I saw him solid walking towards me. I saw him like a movie walking towards me. I don't even know how to explain it. But here he was. My eyes were open and he's walking towards me. 
I got goosebumps, I have to tell you. <laughs> and he's laughing. And this whole bench is full, except for immediately beside me. All the rest of the seats are taken. So he's laughing and he walks up and he sits down beside me to my right. And he goes like this. He goes, wouldn't she be surprised to know that I'm here? And he laughs, pointing at the woman beside him. Like, imagine if she knew that I was sitting here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in my very, very minimal Italian, grazie mille, signore, buonarati, you know, molto gentile, thank you so much. And he goes, no, 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 just call me Mika. Now, hmm. I don't know if that's a thing or not a thing, but I try in the moment to not get into my head about it. Right. So, so important. Just call me Mika. And so I said, well, Mika, how about, could you tell me something about David that the world doesn't know? And he says, well, before we get to that, I just want you to know for a century, over a million people a year come to see David. And you, Signora, are the first person who's asked me to join them. Oh, yay. <laughs> Bravissima. <laughs> exactly. So I said, well, can you tell me something that the world doesn't know? And it was so amazing. What he said was, and I don't, I'd never read the agony and the ecstasy. I didn't really know a lot about him. He said, David was the son I never had. And again, it's easy to get caught up in your head. Did he have children? Didn't he have, didn't go there. Mm -hmm. David was the son I never had. And so I figured I'll check it out. I'll check that later. Yep. And then uh, he said, you know, that story you hear about me um, where I knew that David was in the stone and I just carved away all the parts that didn't belong. Yep. He said, Signora, I would like to give you a gift of wisdom. And that is the importance of self-chiseling. He mm -hmm. said, what part of you is not yet revealed? What part of you can you chisel away so that your true essence can be revealed? Yes. So amazing. So, <laughs> so we're in that moment together and I don't know how to explain it except that I could feel his presence beside me. And so whatever the little chit chat happened, and then someone came by and bumped my leg and the spell was broken. Yeah. And so I went back to the hotel later and I checked and he didn't have children. And so interesting. Yeah. And David could have been the son he never had. Yeah, exactly. And then the next day we're in Rome and checking into the hotel i'm hot it's i'm tired whatever but my son wanted to go into the little bodega a little and get a little soda and snack or something so i'm sort of on autopilot but we buy the little snacks and i'm right at the checkout counter there's a chocolate bar with a cow on it and when i lived in austria when i was 18 i used to buy this chocolate with the cow on it i'm not really looking at the label i'm just seeing the cow. oh i remember this cow chocolate so i don't usually buy chocolate but i bought the chocolate we go into the room, I toss the bag onto the bed. And the, it, the chocolate bar falls out of the bag. And the name of the chocolate is M-I-L-K-A. And I hear Mika in my mind say, what if the L was silent? It becomes Mika. Mm -hmm. Don't have to prove it to anybody else. It was a moment of pure joy as he validated yeah. his presence. I love it. And the fact that it fell out of the bag. Well, it's it's fun to play. Yes. It's fun to play and it's wondrous and it keeps us connected with higher consciousness. What I love about your work is, again, you're getting wisdom that helps the journey. You're helping people do the self-chiseling. Yes. What have you had to chisel away in you to increase and prove your connection with spirit? You know, it goes back to what you call those, that BS, the belief systems, you know, the things that all oh, my whole life, this is true. That's not true. That truth binary. Mm -hmm. I've been a prisoner of that truth binary. And so to the what if has helped me in my self-chiseling 
because I make room for another possibility besides what it is I already have always believed. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the price, and maybe I said this, I can't recall, but, you know, Suzanne, I, I honor every person on a grief journey, but at some point when Scott passed, and I think I, t- I talk about being sort of getting drunk on grief every night. I don't know if we talk. I don't know, but if you did do it again, because it's valuable. So I realized for better or worse, it felt like I was closer to him if I was in agonizing pain. So you're not really getting drunk. You're using that as a metaphor. No, exactly. I'm using it as a metaphor. Because if you think about it, I have a thought which triggers, so Scott was killed, which triggers an emotion and that emotion triggers a cascade of chemicals, like like tequila shots poured over my brain into my body. Mm-hmm. And so then you have another thought, which triggers another emotion, which triggers those chemicals. And it is a physiologic process. And at some point, one of the doctors I work with gave me a book by Dr. Joe Dispenza, and he spelled out the science. I didn't realize that I was becoming a griefaholic. Wow. Oh, I've never heard that term. And I have a friend who's been in grief for 20 years, but I understand how addicting those chemicals can be. But why when they don't feel good? It's a, well, I don't feel good if I were to drink tequila shots and wake up the next morning either. But people- yeah, but initially you do, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But there is something twisted as this may sound. I felt closer to him. Ah, there you go. When I was in pain. And some people feel that that the amount of their grief equals how much they loved that person. Exactly. Yes. Which is not, they don't need us to grieve them. Yeah. So yeah. at some point, I call it grief aritas, like margaritas, but grief aritas. So mm-hmm. I was drinking grief aritas every night until I realized at some point, and I don't think we always know the the things that play behind the scenes, but I realized that I wasn't closer to him. I was pushing him farther away because of the the intoxication of those chemicals. Like Mm -hmm. essentially, if you think about the chakras and the central nervous system, and I'm suppressing the central nervous system with my grief. Yes. So I'm driving down the road and I'm on the phone with a friend who can say anything to me. You know, you have those friends who have permission to... Yeah, thank goodness. Thank mm-hmm. And so he's saying to me, your grief is too loud. You need to stop this. You if he, you know, he's sitting right beside you, you couldn't hear it because your grief is too loud. You need to stop it. Like stop it. You know, like the way you slap yeah. people in the old westerns. Stop mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. And I realized in that moment that if I was going to access him, I needed to not be an aholic of my grief. <laughs> And so I have this epiphany in this moment and I'm on the phone with a friend and I pull up, there's a car in front of me that stops at the stop sign and I pull up behind this vehicle. In that moment of, you know, the the clouds parting, I pull up in front of this, behind this car and the, the wheel cover on the back of the car in big letters says, Scott. No. (laughs) (laughs) God wink. (laughs) <laughs> exactly so that, it's like, that was the i realized for me the price that i had to pay and i'm in i'm completely serious in this there was a cost for admission and the cost that i was going to have to pay was i had to be willing to lay down my grief in order to access him and how did you do that one breath at a time the choice, it's kind of like the alcoholic analogy, right? Is I have to choose not to pick up and drink that grief shot. Mm-hmm. And so the- Change your thoughts, shift them, go to what if, right? Just, yeah. j- just say, all right, I have a new mission instead of wallowing in my grief, which serves a purpose. It's good to feel it. Now we're going to shift and de- have a new mission to connect with my loved one. Yes. And the number, and I started asking for help. And that's, if I, if somebody said, okay, you can only give people one word 
to help them on their journey and you don't get to give them any other word. The word is ask. Mm. We live in a free will universe. It isn't a religious construct. It's a universal one. And I, we talked about this last time that asking is imperative because consent isn't implied. So ask, ask. And I just started asking it. Uh, not just Scott, anybody who's not nailed down in the spirit world, I need help. I don't know what I'm doing. Help me figure it out. Wow. That friend was a godsend. Yeah. hundred percent. Beautiful. What's your greatest advice for anybody who's trying to connect and feels they're just not getting anywhere? One is to have the courage to be wrong, like be brave enough to be in a novice. You got to start somewhere. You don't start out where I am today or where you are today, you, but you have to start somewhere. You started somewhere. I started somewhere. So start. And ask. zero. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> Less than zero, probably. And how... This is what I say. This is not a spectator sport. You got to get on the field. You got to get muddy. You got to get dirty. You got to get it wrong. You got to experiment. And I don't understand. And, you know, we have to just put ourselves on the field and engage. And I didn't know what I was doing. And I didn't have anybody to ask except you. <laughs> so it's... You have to start someplace, but here's well. Can I give a good plug right now? Yes, please. Yes, <laughs> my new yeah. book, my new book, the yeah, Awakened yeah, yeah. Way, the Awakened Way, making the shift to a divinely guided life. Hopefully, we'll take a lot of the effort out for people because it gives the foundational information and over twenty four tools, tips, techniques, and practical things that you can do to connect. So, if you and I had had something like that, uh, it would have made it much easier. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but now you still have to get on the field, but with a little more direct guidance. So you can find uh, some promotional things we're running right now with some gifts for pre-ordering the Awaken Way or just go straight to Amazon and order it. It's actually, I should have my own copy in hand any minute now. So I'm excited. Nice. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, that's it. Get Just dive right in. Well, and the thing that I forgot to mention last time that I wanted to make sure to say out loud is... I'm going to be totally transparent here. Oh, and you I, always are. <laughs> but I was such a dork because the day that you and I had the conversation, you said, I, you said, I said, how do I connect? You connected. How do I connect? And you said, I'm just trying to make sure I get this right. You said, this, you said meditation. And I said, an expletive. And you said, no, no, no. Think about it differently. Prayer is asking and thanking. Meditation is listening. And that was my liberation. You truly gave me the liberation to understand that I don't need to do all this, you know, pretzeling. I just need to listen, I need to be quiet and listen. But you said hemisync will help you. And I just have to give a completely shameless plug for, and I know you have quite a lot of CDs, but mediumship the training ground was the one that i that was the only one that was out at the time those are the binaural beats that aid in meditation that's what hemisync is yeah and i have several like you're right uh, guided meditations that have the binaural beats and i use them to this day my own recordings yes and i'll tell you the reason why i love that particular one it's great for the beginner and it has four tracks there might be some like bonus something, but four tracks. One, you're talking and telling us how to do starting point. And then there's a track, which is just the tones and the music. And then we get to the next track where you're guiding us. And then there's just tones in the music. I, I, <laughs> I listened to this first track of you telling me how to do it 500 times. Like oh. again and again, and I didn't need yeah. variety. I wasn't looking for variety. I was looking for instruction. So I listened and listened. I wasn't even brave enough to get to the next one of you talking. But even the instructions have the binaural beats in it. So totally, totally. Yeah. But I just, 
I didn't, I didn't, okay, like, when do I know I'm ready to go to the next one? So then I graduated to the next track of you guiding me. But when it's all said and done, and I sort of felt like I had my legs under me, there was still two tracks where I didn't necessarily need talking. And so it's, it's like four for one. It's like the most brilliant tool, but here's the part where I'm going to just be brutally honest. And so, because I want to tell people that I got it wrong. When you told me to listen, <laughs> you told me to, okay, here's a tool. I buy it and I'm doing it and I'm meditating an hour in the morning and an hour at night and all this stuff's happening. I didn't know that I was supposed to listen to it with headphones on. Ah. So it was a year of no headphones before I came across something that said, oh, you really should listen to it with the headphones on. So I can tell you it will work without them, but it works better with them. Oh, so my headphones goodness. are important. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, headphones help. But I will also tell you that I never meditated an hour in the morning, an hour at night. So don't everybody run out and say, oh, I don't have that time. And no, me. No, you don't need to. I was just. You're dedicated. And you, yeah. Yeah. But you you did it. And. Today, you're helping so many people and teaching classes. You have your Oracle cards. Your website is what? Quantumalchemy.world. And why is it called that? That's a great question. For me, I'm intrigued by the idea of the ancient alchemists. And, you know, in the oversimplistic sense, we think of the alchemist as someone who was trying to take base metals and turn it into precious metals, right? Turn it into yeah. gold. Yeah. So I didn't know until I went down that rabbit hole that the alchemists weren't just about the physical turn lead into gold. It was a spiritual practice for them as how do they turn themselves into gold as well? Yes. So the, the process of continually trying to turn myself into another iteration of gold, but the quantum piece of it is there to acknowledge a graduation from the Newtonian binary of true-false, the quantum piece of it acknowledges, what if there's more? What, what if, if we don't understand everything? So and We don't understand everything. And that's why we still have people who think that consciousness dies when the brain no longer functions. And you and I are playing in a realm where we meet people who tell us it doesn't die. We're still here. Yes. Yeah. Well, Cheryl, thank you so much. I just thoroughly loved the conversation part two again. And yeah, you could be like, you know, I've been on Alex Ferrari's show and, and he, he calls me a returning champion. You, you're, you can be our returning champion. <laughs> I'll get you back on messages of hope. But it, it, I, love, I love that you and I are now dancing together and learning from each other. It's, that's the way life works, these relationships. So I hope all of you listening and watching I uh, found your community here with the Awaken Way community that you find kindred spirits around you that you can play and dance with and ask what if. Any final parting words, Cheryl? Yes. And I'm so intrigued and you probably know this, but I think it's it's to emphasize the infinite possibilities. So you know how we sort of bandy about the idea of a million and a billion, yeah. and then you hear about the deficit, it's a trillion. Yeah know what those numbers really mean other than we can sort of think about a million so i just want to give people this to to wrap your head around so a million seconds was 11 days ago okay a billion seconds was 31 years ago wow and a trillion seconds ago was 31000 bc hmm. so the reason why that's important is in this sea that we're swimming in, like the whales are in the ocean, you and I are in this quantum field, the whales, every whale in the planet is connected by that body of water, right. right? And you, where you are, and me in Colorado, we're connected by this ocean that we're not aware of. And it's, we're not separated by it. We're connected by it. And so the reason that's important is, there was a measurement done of, okay, so how much energetic potential is in one sugar cube of space? And there's really smart people who figure this out. Yes. And it's 10 comma 93 zeros. I think that a trillion 
zeros is 16. And that's oh. 31,000 years. So 10 common 93 zeros in one sugar cube of space, it speaks about the energetic potential for us. I'm connected with Suzanne and everyone listening, and we're connected with our loved ones in spirit. That We're all in the same ocean. Yeah, we sure are. So, so much more is possible. And some so wise, just in. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Never underestimate that more is possible than what is apparent in front of us. So what Perfect. if keeps us in that larger space? Well, you sent me a coffee mug with what if on it. I'm going to pull it out and have some tea in that tonight, I think. <laughs> okay. All right, friend. I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Everybody, isn't she great? All right. We love you and uh, we love all of you in our community. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you back here again next week.